Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm Reagan Kelly, and I'm joined by all my awesome co-hosts. Laura Nash, how are you doing, Laura? I am doing excellent. I got a blanket. I'm ready for winter and the IF Comp results. Yes, and Nate, how are you doing, Nate Heidinger? I uh, ditto. Although, I guess, not ditto. I don't have a blanket. I have a jacket, and I'm ready to talk about some IF Comp results. And my brother and bro host, Shane Kelly, how are you doing, Shane? Still in Texas, still warm. <laughs> Only time of year I really envy you there, man. Texas is Texas winters are kind. Yeah, we had we had a, a literally a perfect day just a couple of days ago. Um, it was like like mid seventies the entire day. Took the baby on a walk down to a uh, local restaurant. Had to chase some wild dogs because uh, you know. East End Houston, but other than that, it's great. <laughs> Wild dogs. And uh, this week we are going to be wrapping up uh, IF Comp. So IF Comp uh, 2017 concluded a good little while ago. We were a little late on the ball on this one. So apologies to our listeners if you were waiting with bated breath for the wrap up. I assume that folks have already checked out the results of the IF Comp on the IF Comp website. Um, we're just going to kind of give some parting thoughts on IF Comp 2017, talk about the the games that were in the top 10, um, and just sort of cap things off. Uh, cause, yeah. Man, this was a great year for the IF Comp. And we really wanted to do that episode on 30 Flights of Loving. So uh, that was a really fun one. So if you haven't checked that out, go, go back and listen to that for a break from IF Comp. But we are here to cap this off. This I I had a blast covering uh, IF Comp. I also want to shout out to all the like the authors and just the the fans that were very vocal to us uh, through Twitter and whatnot about IF Comp. It was very fun hearing from all of you. Yeah, super fun. Um, I, I look forward to this every year, and this sort of becomes the IF Comp show for a little while towards the end of every year, which is absolutely fine by me. I've I've just had a ton of fun with it. So this year's comp was pretty spectacular in some interesting ways like the uh you know i didn't crunch these numbers these were presented on the if comp blog but a few kind of interesting things about this year's competition uh the top dozen games the top 12 games in the voting this year had average scores above seven which is really high um you know when you play a lot of video games you get used to these these numerical game scales where you know six is garbage fire seven is slightly smaller garbage fire anything lower than nine is like a real diss well that's not really how people vote in the if comp you know people do give people have their their own systems mostly but it gives you some guidelines about how to vote and i think really anything above a six is really good and yeah it's a game you should play it's a game you want uh you think is worth looking at in detail. I mean, I gave some scores that are were a little lower if games were buggy, but I didn't, you know, it wasn't like in a, if I was writing for Polygon, I feel like I would be rating things a three or a nine. <laughs> There's a little more nuance here. <laughs> no diss to Polygon. I love Polygon, but. Well, they're part of a, they're part of a whole, you know, point economy that, you know, they, they have to place things, in the similar places to their other you know, to other sites in the same space, or they seem weird, right? I'm really questioning all of you guys' uh, review ethics right now. Just <laughs> it's really important to have good ethics in games journalism. And I think <laughs> scoring things oh, using the full using the full ten points to score Luckily, is very important. We don't actually score anything on points, and we all kept our numerical scores for these games secret from each other. Yeah, uh, that mm-hmm. is a good that is a good point. We literally uh, this is literally might be the only scores that I've given any games uh, over the course of this year in the short game. I don't I don't point rank anything. Yeah, I did vote this year, and I was excited to do so, but um, we didn't share our votes on the show, so I think we should probably keep to that. Did anybody else have to, like, go back through, you, you rank all the game, you assign all the points, and then you just, like, obsess over going back through the point ranking and thinking, well, is this game really one point better than that game? Are these <laughs> yep. two games really the same number of points? That's why I really, really like that they let you go back and, like, revise your yeah. ballot again and again and again until the final scoring. Oh, man, I definitely did that. Yeah. 
One thing that I think is really fun about the results part of IF Comp is that they do give you a lot of data about how people voted. And so you can see, you know, why things worked out the way they did, including some nice graphs. So if you are, you know, listening right now uh, and you're kind of wanting to, you know, take a look into this stuff, pull up the IF Comp webpage, pull up the results for the 2017 competition and look at the graphs. They're, you know, they really do a great job with this. And for every one of these games, you can see what their final score was, how many votes were cast for that game, which is a really interesting thing in and of itself. You kind of get a sense of like, okay, how many people actually check this out? Uh, and then a standard deviation, which is a really interesting thing to see. Mm -hmm. uh, and you get a graph and you can mouse over the graph and see, you know, okay, this game got uh, 10 tens and 15 eights and one weirdo gave it a three, you know, like there's you get this really interesting kind of peek into how people voted. It's one of my favorite things about the sort of wrap up phase after the competition results are released. Yeah. And I'll say that none of the top two games, no one gave it below a three. So even if people hated it, they hated it and still thought it was good. <laughs> yeah. And on the inverse of that, I, I won't, you know, name any of them, but it is pretty interesting to look at the games that this, this, this year had a pretty, a larger pool than usual. And so the games that were like the bottom were particularly unliked by people. I, I didn't even go and play them, but some of these games at the bottom were like significantly voted bad. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting to see how that ranks, you know, it, um, the sort of the difference between the games that win and the games that don't. So a lot of these games that are in the top 10 are something we've already talked about in some previous episodes. We're not going to be going into a ton of depth here. We're really just going to talk kind of what the results are. Um, there are some games in the top 10 that we didn't touch on previously, and we're going to try to discuss them a little bit. Also, we're just going to go from first place down. We're not really announcing results. We don't need drum rolls. We don't need to count up to the top. So let's just talk about what won. Um, starting with first place winner, uh, The Wizard Sniffer by Buster Hudson. Ooh. Yeah, this is um, I, I, I knew this one was going to win just because of how much I laughed when you described it. I still have not gotten a chance to play it. I, I think this will be one that I play during at some point during 2018. Though. I, I've, I've definitely I'm going to have to go back to this one. Yeah, this game is a classic. Like this is an instant classic. That's what I was thinking too, Reagan. It feels like this is going to be one of those games that just gets added in like every IF sort of maybe package you download like want to learn about if here's the wizard sniffer you know um it, yeah it's... and i started it it's i mean it's a it's got a rating of 8.57 which is apparently the highest score in if comp history so no way yeah and it won miss congeniality so it literally won all of the possible prizes <laughs> It's a sweep. Yeah, this thing, this thing just destroyed the competition this year. It's um, the Titanic of... Well, narrowly destroyed. Yeah, that's true. 8.57, though, like, like we don't, I don't Wait, want to move off that. I don't too, think you can narrowly like, destroy. That's I'm not, crazy <laughs> high. I'm saying number two is an 8.45. Yeah, that's like, a nitpick. Those are but... ridiculously high. Yeah, and the, the previous high, uh, high point for score was almost 10 years ago. It was Violet, which was in the 2018 comp and got uh, well, 8.5. 2008. Three. Time oh, travel. Excuse me. You not, said 20. <laughs> I did. Um, uh, 2018. Uh, I'm not going to edit that because I'm lazy. That's an amazing game. I, I've played it before. Uh, it's, I played it years ago now, so I, I kind of really don't remember much about it other than that I thought it was really good. But, I mean, that for that score to be the high kind of high score in the competition for so many years speaks to how kind of rare an achievement it is to get such like universal voter acclaim in the comp. And looking at the way that these votes are distributed is a little bit interesting too. Um, 63 votes cast, which is actually kind of lower than some of the others in the top mm -hmm. 10. Uh, not the lowest in the top 10, but like not a, t not a huge number of people comparatively, I guess, played this game. Um, but almost all of them were nines, tens, or eights. Like, uh, 19 tens, 18 nines, 13 eights, and 10 sevens. And then just a couple of people lower than that. Like almost everyone who played this game enjoyed it well enough to give it a seven or better. And that's insane uh, compared to other games in this list. Anyway, 
Wizard Sniffer is great. I talked a whole lot of sugar about it on the uh, our first episode on this year's IF Comp, and um, I don't think we probably need to talk much more about it than that. But this game is phenomenal. If for some reason you didn't listen to, I, to ba- those, the, the quick elevator pitch on the Wizard Sniffer is that it's a parser-based, um, puzzle-oriented game that has f- so much character. Uh, you're playing a, a pig that is owned, presumably, by a really airheaded knight and he thinks that you can sniff out uh wizards uh, to help him like defeat the evil wizard and you have to go into this castle and a lot of the puzzles involve um kind of managing multiple npcs who play out these really hilariously written scenes um it has just so much more like character to it i think than most other parser if that i've played it it just sort of it blew me away. So Wizard Sniffer is, I think, very deserving of first place. But tons of awesome other games to talk about uh, in the top 10 this well, year. Well, you know what? Bef- the one final thing I want to I want to do is that this is officially a our awards show <laughs> because <laughs> we we uh, we assigned these these scores. Right. Uh, so I just want to say congratulations to Buster, Buster Hudson. Yeah, we didn't really congratulate Buster. Mm-hmm. Buster, you did a freaking great job. Man, I, I don't know much about Buster Hudson, but I am. Yeah, he's done a few a few games before. He did um, uh, he did one recently called Fufu. Uh, I've never played it. This would I still have not played any of his work, but uh, <laughs> you know to to make to make his way so quickly into. But it seems great. The <laughs> it does seem great, and to make his way so fast into the uh, the the Hall of Fame of IF, I think is really interesting. Yeah. So speaking of segues, a guy who <laughs> does have quite the uh, pedigree behind him got second place this year. Yes, and uh, in my head, I've been reading a lot of Han. I've been rewatching Hannibal and reading a lot of Hannibal fan fiction recently. So this is kind of like <laughs> first place for where I am in my life <laughs> is Eat Me by Chandler Groover. By Chandler Groover. Also, I want to say too, I don't know exactly what their weighting system is uh, as far as what like an individual vote counts but um this game got 36 more votes almost uh you know the first vote the first game got the game that got first got 63 votes this one got 96 mm-hmm. at an 8.45 overall rating which i think it, 26 tens yeah it's a very very uh i mean that's 36 more votes and almost has a higher overall rating so i think it you know it's one way Wizard Sniffer definitely won and deserves a win, but Eat Me, I feel like, is like a one and one A sort of thing. Yeah. uh, It's really lovely that there are multiple games this year that are just out and out classics. There's nothing, there's, there are winners, but I don't think anything really ran away with it. There were just so many good games this year. Yeah. Chandler Groover is a really important uh, writer in this, you know, in this scene. Um, He's constantly produced stuff that's placed high in IF comp or that, you know, outside of IF comp has just been like widely played and admired. Um, It's always kind of exciting to see something new from him. And I think he's, you know, he's a well-known name, uh, I think, even for for folks who maybe aren't super clued into IF. So it doesn't surprise me that he plays so high. The game is really polished, really good. Um, I actually have to say this isn't my favorite thing of his I've played. Like, I, I liked the game, but I've played some other things from Chandler Groover that I thought were you know, a little more sort of profoundly great. But this is a really good game from a really, really good author. And I'm glad it plays so high. And it's not really surprising. It's just, you know, he's great. Um, And yeah, 96 people played it, uh, or at least played it enough to vote on it, which is, uh, you know, a lot. I think it may be the most out of all the ones on the list here. Yep, as far as I can tell, it's had more people play it than anything else on the list. I yeah. haven't scrolled through everything yet, but I'm pretty I sure. I think that's probably a testament to name recognition. You know, it's like, oh, he has another game in this. I'm going to play him. I mean, that's probably. I mean, I know it was my first we, stop. We we pull games uh, through it for a lot of different reasons, random or recommendation or just name recognition. So I think this was one of the first games we looked at. Makes sense. So it makes sense it would have the most votes, too. Third place was a game that I just played last night, uh, and I am so glad that I did that I didn't like sleep on this one. Um, Harmonia by Liza Daly. Laura, you talked about this on our was it the first or second episode we did on the first one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was one of the first ones I did because I'd played uh, some of her previous work, um, and it 
again, the theming was right up my alley, kind of an academia found manuscript piece. But I really am curious how uh, it hit you. Yeah, it, I, much more oomph to it for me than her previous game, Stone Harbor, which was good. Like it won fourth place last year. This year she hit third. Um, and I mean, it's it's in, it's incredibly polished. Just I loved the the way that it kind of. I don't know how really to, to describe it with that. So what what I think what I think I didn't really pick up from your description of it, Laura, which you did a you did a great job kind of telling why it was great. But what I what sort of surprised me about it, even after hearing you describe it, was that it really is a kind of a slow burn. I don't hope this isn't too much of a spoiler, but it's a slow burn mystery that fades into sort of vaguely science fiction-y territory. Mm-hmm. Um and so like, you know, Laura, you described how it uses uh, like things like footnotes and annotations that are kind of like notes in the margins in a way to kind of tie this idea of being an academic and taking, you know, uh, uh, rifling through papers and doing research and tie that together with the storytelling. But I didn't talk about what was in it, what were, was actually in the writing. You didn't. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it really for anybody either, but what, so all of that stuff about the style of it, the storytelling style being like this idea of like taking the, uh, uh, having a having a narrative that reads like a you know like a journal or you know like a first person uh, narrative but which constantly ties in documents and and footnotes to those documents and annotations of other people's work and of her own writing it felt very like well crafted but the story itself is also fascinating like when you describe it as a story about someone who is, comes to a college to teach a class on utopian uh, literature um, and you know, what does she find there? Well, that sounds, I mean, you know, interesting. I, I'm interested in hearing someone talk about utopian literature, but this very quickly becomes a fascinating mystery and, uh, almost science fiction story that just really drew me in much more than I was expecting based on kind of what I'd kind of originally assumed about it. So if for some reason you didn't play this one, don't sleep on it. It's, it's great. Yeah. That's super intriguing. Um, I still don't really know what it's about, but. Um, yeah, I don't, I I don't want to po- spoil it I for folks here because it is such a short thing. Like you can pull this up on your laptop or iPad and play through this. It's, it you know, it, it's a it's a quick play. I think it took me maybe an hour, um, but it's really really worth it. And it's it, it's it may seem like, uh, I mean, I'm interested in like literature and academic stuff, but it it got it got very more much more kind of wow than that. I think clearly because so you know the first game is about a pig that you know is like a not is a squire basically and then the second game you're only eating things and then now third place you're like setting up as like a very high concept you know really think piece or whatever but it must be accessible and truly interesting for it to be the third choice behind these like you know, like outwardly entertaining pieces, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll say there's a lot of uh, literature that is the academic goes looking through archives and finds something crazy. It's mm-hmm. in that vein. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's not exactly Da Vinci Code or Umberto Echo, but it is that <laughs> same like archivist starts looking somewhere and like uncovers crazy shit. Yeah. So crazy. It's in that shit. genre. Cool. It's great. Yeah, cool. it's really, really fun. Um, and it's uh, it's a twine game. Uh, the the first two are both parser. So I think this is probably the best truly widely accessible thing on here. I mean, I think that both uh, The Wizard Sniffer and Eat Me are pretty accessible. Um, but like, I think voting on IF Comp tends to lean towards um, parser games. Uh, you know, the 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 folks who are consistently every year playing everything and voting in everything in IF Comp are the people who've been around for you know a decade plus and they are parser people. Um, yeah, and I mean you know, it's the crunchiest of right of you know IF, so it makes sense. The people yeah. who are the most invested, you want that like tactile feel of being like a part of it. Not that Twine doesn't do that, but. It's not as involved as a parser where you have to like think about the words and essentially put it to paper and you're not clicking on something. 
Twine stuff has had a kind of an interesting history in the comp, like, you know, some stuff that's now kind of regarded as absolute classics, uh, kind of placed in middling positions. Like, uh, um, I think if I recall correctly, like Howling Dogs, when it first hit, uh, which is, you know, like a masterpiece by Porpentine, um, it was it was like the it won the golden banana of discord award because it had a high standard deviation where some people thought it was brilliant and some people thought it was not good at all and this is another example of like twine stuff and this this other sort of approach to if kind of continuing to rise higher and higher in the comp but it's still not quite there's there's still a kind of there's still some population of the competition you know um uh, audience that is still just really diehard into parsers yeah well the next game won't let me go i just played today shane had played it earlier um is as simple as it gets there's a little bit of visual extras to it mm. but it's just good writing and it's yeah sad and meaningful it's it's the the game about the the man who has alzheimer's um mm -hmm. i think it's uh i think it's either alzheimer's or, or some sort of dementia yeah. And you're the player character is um uh, an elderly man who's just sort of losing it. And um y I actually went back and tinkered with this one a little bit more um and realized that there were actually some things that on my initial playthrough that I thought were puzzles that really not puzzles. Um what was your what was your impression, Laura? Well, I I know what you mean because there are you click words and you correct yourself or you click words and you remember something or you remember something wrong or you have to make a choice whether to, you know, how to react to somebody. Yeah. So there are choices, but not to say puzzles. And I think yeah, that not really about that. I, it, my favorite parts about it is that it played with time in a really lovely way, like a short story would where you, you are going between different memories and the background color might change. And it's not like you're time traveling and it's not like you're trying to, it's not memento, but you're literally just kind of lost in a memory and then you're somewhere else. It, it's one of the most delicate uses of that kind of time jump piece I've seen. Cause it makes you feel like, yeah, I don't know if I'm the whole thing is, when I'm in a nursing home or if the whole thing is me living linearly and just not being able to know where I am, it doesn't matter. It's about creating a mood and putting you in someone's head and feeling empathy and without being a sad piece. There's a lot of humor. I was really surprised at the number of jokes that he makes. Yes. Uh, that's not to, that's not to color this as like a, a, a super happy, no. but it's, it's not super it, happy, but it's not, it, it's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's no, it's absolutely very well written in that way. Uh, I totally agree. I I would recommend this to anybody who doesn't who doesn't really think that uh, that this would be an appropriate or a likely uh, kind of narrative area for games to tread. This is a game that puts you in the the character of someone who is going through something that. A lot of a lot of people dread uh, in their in their future, and uh, is able to figure out ways that he can live with it, and you can you can kind of help him through that as the player. And I thought that was really lovely. I'm uh, I am a little surprised that this game did so well in the results, and it's mainly because if I if I hadn't just sort of picked it based on someone's recommendation, this isn't the subject matter that I would likely have played. So uh, I'm much more much more likely to want to sit down and if I'm having my druthers i'll i'll take the game about the happy pig every day <laughs> yeah, it got second for miscongeniality which is where all the authors vote so i'm kind of touched is not the right word but i'm really happy that the people who make this stuff for a living found just a game with incredible writing and thought that was enough i mean it's not showy Says something to me about the maturity all. of the community around also, i so i i wish they could i wish they could make this stuff for a living i'm sure they all they all 100 <laughs> well, percent have you know what I mean. hey that colossal <laughs> fund i don't know that colossal fund if it keeps getting up there yeah I, yeah they distributed I, I something like I, six thousand dollars so you know there yeah. could be uh these these between I, these 10 authors they're that really was my be optimism speaking i know i, I think know. it's a subject matter that is right for emotion and i think most people i don't you know unfortunately i i think most people have a 
there's not too many steps you have to take to find someone in your life who's impacted by something like that. Um, so I think that it, it's, there's done well. It's a particularly emotional sort of concept and moment. So I'm glad it also, I'm also glad it did so well. It seems like a lot of people felt connected to it. Yeah. And you mentioned it's uh, second place in the Miss Congeniality Awards, just in case it's not clear what that is for somebody who may be new to the comp. Um, there's two sort of side competitions in the uh, the competition this year, or in, in this in, in every year for many years, as far as I know. Uh, Miss Congeniality is basically the same kind of voting uh, practice that you'd have for uh, the regular competition, but only counting votes by the other authors. Um, and so in a sense, like, I think it's kind of even more, you know, interesting to see how those folks voted. You want to be respected by your peers. Yeah. And I think you assume if someone is taking the time to, um, to create interactive fiction, as we just kind of joked about, it is, that is a passion project. It's not a, uh, a, uh, a normally a means to an, to an income. You don't yeah. get into it for the bucks. <laughs> no you one know? does, I'm sure. Uh, so when you find out that your peers, I mean, any, any industry where you find out your peers are, you know, think you did the best. I think that's pretty, pretty re rewarding. Yeah. I think we mentioned it up at the top as well, but uh wizard sniffer won both first place in regular voting and in Miss Congeniality voting. So while we're on this though, th let's talk about the other side award and who won that. Cause I think this yeah. one's really interesting. The Golden Banana of Discord is a pretty interesting award. It's awarded to, and this is actually, it seems semi-unofficial since they don't really list the Golden Banana of Discord on the main page, but it does have a, a separate little listing on the IF wiki, um, and it's been going since 2001. And it's uh, it's awarded to the game with the highest standard deviation in the scores. So basically, the game that is most controversial among voters. Um, you know, when you look at the, the games that, that place or, you know, that, that receive this award, they tend to have a kind of a U-shaped uh, voting uh, graph with many people voting low and many people voting high and not so many in the middle. And um, this year, it would, went to a game uh, called Queer in Public, a brief essay. And uh, Queer in Public is, I, I can see why this was so controversial. It placed, let me see, where did it place in the actual voting? If I recall correctly, it's somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, I would expect it to be. I mean, it, you almost have to imagine. Oh, actually, it's lower it's than low. I would have thought. It's yeah. from the 60s, right? Actually, it's 70th place. 70th oh, wow. place is yeah. very low. But actually, this is kind of unusual. It's uh, If you look at its graph, it's actually really like a lot of it's got 17 ones. So a lot of people did not like it at all. But if you look at it, it's got it's got at least a few people pretty much everywhere along the graph. Uh, one person gave it a 10, three gave it a nine, one person gave it an eight, uh, three gave it a seven, one gave it a six. It's really kind of like evenly spread out. So Queer in Public, uh, which I will I will admit to not thinking it was, you know, it's not for me, um, but it's it's clearly very heartfelt and, and well, like, it, it's well written, but I didn't really kind of feel like it benefited much from its interactivity. Um, it's an essay. I mean, they, they say that right in the title. So it's, it's very much, you know, telling you what it is right off the bat. Queer in Public, a brief essay is, is an essay. Well, their subtext is a hypertext essay about the Christian and LB, LGBT community. And it's by Naomi Z, um, AKA Norbez. Um, a lot of blogs were saying, is this IF? It's not fiction. And I remember that being a big kind of review site thing. So that might be part of the reason why people didn't know how to grade this. Yeah, it's not fiction. And it's also not really interactive. I mean, it's using hypertext as a way of presenting it, but it's mostly just using that to kind of break up an essay into kind of screens of text. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like the idea of interactive nonfiction. It's like uh, like the uh, encyclopedia discs that you would remember they would mm. when like yeah. CD, when like cd-rom and like, carta first start, yeah and carta where there's like little games in it for exploring the encyclopedia that's interactive nonfiction. sorry continue <laughs> i would uh i would review a comp for that <laughs> it kind of uh kind of made me think of like back in the day 
uh, you know, HyperCard. HyperCard was, if you weren't a Mac user back in the 80s and 90s, HyperCard was this tool that you could use for anything from creating a Rolodex for yourself. You know, it was designed to be a tool that you could use to create kind of like little mini databases on your computer, all the way up to it was the tool that was used to create games like Myst. Like, if I remember correctly, like Myst, its first versions were done in HyperCard. Um, So it was this very flexible tool that you could use from anything from, you know, presenting text or creating a database all the way up to creating these extremely detailed, full-fledged game experiences. And that's kind of what Twine is now. Twine is this tool that you can use for practically anything. And anything from these, you know, rich story experiences with lots of interactivity like harmonia all the way to Mm -hmm. you know it's a neat way to create a hypertext web page that just presents text i uh ironically i do keep my rolodex in twine (laughs) (laughs) and laura i think you said you'd you'd used twine for some professional stuff at some point too yes i've used it for prototyping when i don't want my clients to worry about visuals and just thinking about content yeah and so twine is a perfectly good tool for presenting context like queer in public. I think it's actually a totally valid use of Twine to use it as a way to to present uh, like essay con- yeah, essay type material in a slightly more engaging way than just text on a page. But does, does the fact that it's using Twine, a tool designed for IF, um, make it IF? And I, I kind of thought the answer, I, I'm not a prescriptivist. I mean, I've always kind of said I'm a big tent on what counts as a game, but I don't really think this counts as IF for me. I, I, um, I did not end up voting on it, but I don't think I probably would have voted it very high. Um, but it's clear that some people connected with the, you know, with the, um, material, at least one person gave it a 10. So it's a really yeah. interesting example of that side of golden banana discord award. Uh, I, I personally carry around a physical Rolodex. <laughs> um, it goes in my backpack. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, that debate, is it a game is obnoxious and endless, but, uh, if it's, if it's just an essay. Yeah. Every now and then, it, like I, I could, I'm kind yeah. of like, uh, sure. It's a game. Absolutely. It's a game. And then every now and then something comes along and I'm like, but wait, is it? <laughs> well, I, I'm generally, if the, if the person, if the person who made it thinks it's a game, then it's a game. That's generally my like line but i I would wonder if they think so if they just thought this was an interesting uh you know yeah they called it a brief essay so yeah Yeah, so do they even think it's a game and i could see why people would vote no for so the next game down the list uh continuing with the top 10 is the fifth place game absence of law by math brush so first of all i'll just say um the only reason we didn't cover this on the show was that we didn't want to present any possibility of uh, of um, conflict or or what have you. Um, Mathbrush was kind enough to help us with suggestions and and uh, and you know assistance in trying to kind of organize our coverage. He knows the scene better than we do, um, and he's the one uh, we mentioned in the kind of intro episode that uh, did that incredible series of articles on the history of the competition. So, you know, this guy knows IF, knows the history of the IF comp. Um, he placed really well last year. Uh, what was last year's game from from Math Brush? It was a uh, second place, uh, Color the Truth. Color the Truth was rad. It was a great mystery. It was really, really well told. I really, really liked it. Um, I played this year's game by Math Brush, and I also liked it, but I'm probably the wrong person to really give it a review. It's much more puzzly uh, than, I guess, Color the Truth was, or kind of maybe the, the puzzles didn't quite click for me as, as now well. Now here's, here's everyone's favorite part of an episode where we make fun of Reagan's puzzle skills. I know. Puzzle Dunce <laughs> Reagan, of course, ended up playing all the really puzzle-heavy stuff. You remember when I uh, I, I told you, you guys you about... You were like an like a magnet for them this year. You I kept know. finding the hardest puzzles in the entire I Have Comp and then being like... <laughs> trying to play them. I felt kind of similar about this that I did to uh, The Wand by Arthur DiBianca, which I talked about on one of the episodes um, before. 11th, I think. Yeah, it won 11th, 11th place. So it just barely didn't make it into the top 10. And I told you guys earlier, it's a brilliant game that just I didn't connect with probably because of the puzzle content. I felt the same way about Math Brush's game this year. Um, Absence of Law is clearly polished. It's definitely funny. Although I will say that the, the humor of it didn't connect as as much with me as um, some of the other stuff in the comp this year. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's funny. Like, it's definitely a funny game. And it's got much more colorful, funny language than, for example, um, The Wand, which was a little bit more kind of dry humor, just just barely filling in around the edges of the puzzles. This is, uh, this is a really neat 
concept for a game too. I think this is a, so um, sixth place just below this was the Owl Consults. We talked a lot when we were talking about the Owl Consults about games that kind of give you a parser, but kind of recontextualize that parser in, you know, what is that part, when you're typing into that parser, what are you doing? Um, in the Owl Consult, you were talking on the phone. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a second, but in the absence of law, you're talking, you're, you're typing into a, um, into a text-based like terminal style operating system. And uh, so the, the premise of uh, absence of law is that there is this crazy um, uh, laboratory uh, where they bring the dead back to life. They do cloning. They do all kinds of bizarre stuff. And uh, uh, the head of that laboratory has recently died. But fortunately, his brain was backed up, but he's only got a limited amount of battery power. And so he's reaching out to you to basically hack into his lab because his employees don't know that he's dead, to hack into his lab to try to, um, I guess, clone him, get him back into a body. Uh, I didn't get far enough to complete it, so I, I don't know exactly how things ro uh, turn out with that. But what I loved about this game was that it really does present this the parser as an operating system. So you're, you know, you, you have a home folder. You can go back to that home folder. You can list commands. Um, but most of the puzzle action of the game uh, you're interacting with the equipment and security system of the laboratory. Um, where that gets really interesting is you can switch between different areas of the laboratory because you're really just looking through the cameras and the walls. You can uh, you know interact with things, but only in a very limited way because you know you don't you're not in the laboratory. You're interacting with devices and other stuff that's connected to the network in the laboratory. Um, and so some of the puzzles were really clever. I found, I, you know, I, I got a little overwhelmed with it and I didn't end up completing it. But if you're more in that puzzle, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a better puzzler than me and that doesn't take much, I think this game is really good. Um, I, I felt, yeah, I felt kind of similar about it to the way that I did about, uh, the, the wand, another game that I'm like, wow, this is cool. And I know I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> We got to start giving those games to Laura I and know. then just like Reagan, you take the, uh, the wizard sniffer of next year and then ah. we'll, uh, we'll flip it around. Yeah. Fight you for it. Uh, but yeah. So if we can move forward to the Al consults, um, that was probably my favorite game that I played for the, uh, for the comp. I'm glad to see it play so high. I thought it might get even higher cause it, it, it's just very, very, it's very funny and it, it has a tone that is just really enjoyable. Um, and I, and I thought that perspective was great that the, you're on the phone and you're telling someone what to do, like the sort of twist on parser. It's so close to absence of law and won't let me go. I mean, it's, 7.96 absence of law was 7.98 <laughs> like, yeah that's true it's They're ridiculously all there. like yeah. everything's so close that it could have easily placed higher yeah there are some actual ties too uh I, I don't know how common that is on the voting here but not in the top 10 but there if you look through the list there's some actual ties for places which is crazy when you consider how like you know this goes it to, goes two to decimal the second points. decimal yeah oh man <laughs> uh but yeah I mean, I, i'm glad the the out consults is definitely worth playing i think it's it's light. The puzzles are are fine. They're fun. They more serve a purpose to like what's happening. They're kind of silly. Sometimes they if can you've be ever worked telephone tech support, this is this is a game you'll enjoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it, yeah. It's just it's silly, and you know, like superheroes and everything is so big right now. Of course, that it it's like a just a silly take on that. Um, you know, one of the the one of the very first puzzles that you do is you have to take a you're somebody who gains the power of anything that it that that it eats that the person eats and so like one of the first things you do is take a bite out of a giant octopus so that you can compress your body and fit through a thing it's just funny that's amazing yeah and um so it, it was good and i'm glad it, it plays so well oddly i wish i'd done that earlier because i've read all of the Chew comic books, and it's just about food-related superpowers. <laughs> oh, so, there you go. Yeah, it's it's one of the 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 game switches around like vignettes of different people that uh, the owl is consulting, uh, but one of them that's their power, and all the puzzles are related to them being able to eat something to gain the power of what they ate. <laughs> what a cool game! Uh, did any of us play the seventh place game, A Beauty Cold and Austere? 
I have, yes. Uh, I played it just today because I saw it was a gap in our uh, in our reviews. Ooh, good. Uh, and this is a really interesting one. Um, it's not the kind of game that I would typically play, just, you know, again, picking from the list. Uh, let me kind of set it up for you. Uh, so you start off in a uh, dorm room, and you've got in your inventory a math book. Uh, and it starts you off with the source. This source quote uh, of you know the des- describes math as having a uh, a beauty cold and austere. <laughs> um, this is by far the most educational um, IF that I've ever played, uh, and it's really old school in in how it's designed. So the the game, um, the first thing I did was I heard a party uh, in the um, uh, you know, down the hall. And I was like, oh, well, that sounds good. I went and did that. Well, you lose right away uh, because the whole point of the game is that you have to take a pill uh, and then fall asleep holding your math book uh, so that you can be transported into a a math dream that will let you learn math uh, by experiencing it through vivid hallucination. (laughs) Wow. Wow. That's a lot. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a game that takes place sort of in a dream about math, and you you mean you start off literally on a you know in a point, and then you you know can transform that point into a number line, um, and there's just a series of very uh, clever puzzles. I I did not make it the whole way through the game, but I really enjoyed the puzzles that I did play. I had to bust out the um, the I had to bust out some clues. Uh, because I'm really bad at math and I'm really bad at puzzles, so this is a double <laughs> whammy. Uh, but it, I, what I really liked about it is the sort of overall feel of like it, it was very abstract, but I never really felt like I was lost. Like the the descriptions of everything were pretty um, uh, pretty tightly written, and so you you could really tell like uh, what you're supposed to act on in some way. And having a having a little bit of background knowledge of you know high school math uh, is helpful. Uh, there's some some fun moments in it, so I uh, I would recommend it. It's um, it's a it's a good one for puzzle fans for sure. And uh, eighth place is another game that we had already previously talked about. Uh, Nate, I believe you uh, gave us a rundown on uh, 1958 Dancing with Fear uh, by yeah. Victor Owell. Ojul? Yeah, Ojul is what I, I assume, but yeah. Owell. Yeah, I I also am am glad to see this play so well. This game. Uh, the thing that stuck out to me is it does such a good job of sort of presenting tone and um, sort of theme and environment. Uh, it really does feel like a sort of noir-esque detect, um, mystery sort of thing. It, it just it kind of oozes that feeling all throughout. Um, I thought uh, the the writer did a good job of doing uh, – it was very purposeful. You know, and uh, and I'm glad to see so many people felt felt that. So um, it is unlike the other ones I played, where maybe they're funny, or maybe they're very heavy puzzle, or maybe they're very very smart. This one just I don't know presents like a cool story and a cool theme and a cool environment, and does it really really well. So um, I, I definitely recommend it. Cool, and um, I guess the uh, the ninth game on the list is one that. Uh, we didn't talk about on any previous episodes either, uh, and that one was Future Threads by Zavid, X-A-V-I-D. Laura, I think you played some of this today? I did. It is the third witch game that I played in IF Comp. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it, oddly, I was having flashbacks to Thule because they both start off with you have this vision of something coming to attack you and you have to stop it. Um, it was oddly the premise for both of them. This one was a, um, a fair amount more complex because you also have to protect, um, someone, Kayla, it doesn't say if it's her daughter or, but it, or a ward or what, but it's a little girl who is defenseless without you. Um, but there is, you have a vision of the future. These, um, specters are coming to attack you, but you know that you're not going to be able to be there when they attack. So you have to taking everything you know from your vision, change things on the island, uh, and make it so that the seven things about to attack her, you have to take out each of the seven, you know, changing the future, changing this vision little by little until she can stand and defend herself on her own. So it's a lot 
more heavy puzzles. It's a lot longer than um, than Thule. Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think I had to use the hints more than I would have liked, mostly because um, the hints cycle through. You know, you're moving around a map to different spots, and the hints will sometimes try to tell you what you're doing in your spot. But I think it's intentionally a very open-ended puzzle game where you can do a lot of different things to solve the puzzles. So sometimes I'd be on a certain path and the hints would be telling me about a different one. Um, with such an open-ended game, I think you need a little bit more coaching, but I probably could have gone through um, without hints. I just got stuck. Yeah. I played through the first puzzle or so, um, and uh, I, I definitely there's a few things about it that I thought were like really nice. One that's like very obvious is that this is a uh, parser based game that at least in the the online version that I was playing has an on-screen map. You don't see that very often. Yes. And um, it's very important in this because, you know, you're essentially trying to help uh, this young girl, Kayla, uh, find a defensible position basically. And um, being able to sort of visually see where you are and where Kayla is on the map really helps with that because you can lead her around, but you can also leave her and go someplace else. And so it'll show you on the map where she is and where you are. And if you're not around, she will wander. And as you change the environment, it will also continue changing the map, which I loved. Also, hallelujah for an inventory system where everything is useful. Yeah. You're not just picking up random stuff. (laughs) (laughs) IF doesn't have a lot of red herring items usually, but like um, this one, like every one of them felt like it could, and I didn't get far enough to really tell, but it, every one of them felt like it could potentially be part of a scheme, uh, you know, so, some sort of plan to prepare, uh, Kayla for the, for the attack. So I, I loved the, um, I loved the presentation with the map. I loved what I played of it so far. The puzzles didn't over the, the first puzzle that I did play through, um, didn't really overwhelm me. Uh, so it seemed like it was kind of on my level. Um, I, the only reason I didn't uh, play through it was I was playing it just before we recorded. Yeah, I, I I don't think it's extremely hard. I think there's just a couple times where I didn't have the right verb, where I had the right action, but I didn't know something was available. So I should have just typed help and learned the list of possible commands earlier. I think that would have unlocked quite a few things for me. Yeah. Um, the 10th place entry was one that we also talked about on a previous episode, but I think uh, we've played a bit more of it. There are, when we talked about domestic elementalism, which won 10th place, uh, ten, domestic elementalism by fire is normal. Um, yeah, we... I, I, I tried to review this one, um, and I had some trouble with it, but I'm, so I'm really glad that, um, some more people have, have stepped up and, and played it. I eventually realized the error of my ways, uh, that I had been trying to run this on an iPad, foolish boy. Uh, but, yeah, so this is a this was a tremendous game. Uh, once I actually got to playing it, uh, what did you guys think of it? I really enjoyed it. Um, again, more riches. Huh. Uh, I it is delightful in a way that I wasn't expecting. I think that there are a couple times where um, it feels kind of gated. Where if you don't get past that puzzle, I think it would be pretty um, underwhelming. But it's surreal. It's silly, and I it reminded me of like Haiti and Land's Light Mm -hmm. in that you're transforming out things between elements that you are really managing a lot of different uh, parts that you're going back and forth between rooms to solve puzzles. Um, I really, I understand why it's 10th because it's um, a lot of um, more ideas. It might not be as polished as some of the higher games, but the writing is delightful and I, I, I was really charmed by it. Yeah, and uh, this game won third place in the Miss Congeniality Awards. So uh, obviously, the uh, the authors agreed with you. Um, this is it's always kind of interesting to see what games place higher in that Miss Congeniality Awards than than sort of in the general voting. Um, and both second and third place in that uh, did this year. Um, I mean, I think people were. You know, I think what they're probably seeing here was that this has clearly got some really clever ideas about interface as well. I mean, I, I mentioned in, when we talked about this last time that it kind of reminded me of last year's Detective Land a little bit, a kind of a smooth blending of um, visual interface with parser interface. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a really, really well done game. I'm glad that it got into that 10th place position. I know that, you know, when folks 
five years from now, when folks look back over the history of the comp, people look at those top five or 10 games and they don't go farther down the list, I'm afraid. Sometimes that means they're missing some really amazing stuff. It's, it's always nice to see what, see things hit that top 10 that I think are really, really good and, and that people ought to, ought to try out. This is a great game. I also really loved that the idea is that the girl's gone to an academic conference and she's come back and her house is just horrendously messed up and she's trying to figure out why. So not only are there lots of details about how specifically the house is messed up, but there's also a lot of um, bits strewn in about her work in elemental uh, academic witchery. And it's just, it's not heavy handed. It's just, there's lots of little jokes about, you know, being a, someone who doesn't leave her house a lot and just kind of reads books to herself. I can't imagine anything more devastating than coming home from a, from a conference and finding that someone had messed with my house. (laughs) Nothing more devastating. Before we start wrapping up, do we want to mention anything else on the list that we think was uh, cool that didn't quite meet that top 10 that we think folks exploring the comp ought to check out? Yeah. um, I, I hadn't played it when you guys talked about it. I think we talked about it as a group, though, for like 15 minutes. It might be the game we talked about the most, Insignificant Little Vermin. Uh, it came in 17th. Uh, I think it might be a it, – it was a truly, truly interesting uh, sort of structure and UI. I guess maybe the writing wasn't as good as some of the writing that we saw in the uh, games that won, but I think that we'll probably see – uh, the guy, Philip Harasik, Harasik, who made Insignificant Little Vermin, Vermin, expand that into a full game that will probably do really well in the future. Yeah, I um, I signed up for his uh, mailing list and already got a, an email from him saying that they he had published something uh, to egamebook.com that was a continuation of it. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but um, I think he may already have some new stuff out. So I'm keeping an eye on that. Um I wanted to draw attention to a game that I didn't get a chance to play very much uh, while we were talking about things in depth, but I, I've played a bit more of it now, and that's um, Alice A Forethought by Hannon Andersek. Uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, he had that game that we talked, that Laura, you talked about on last year's competition. Um, what was it called? Fair? Um And uh, this year, Alice of Forethought is an Alice in Wonderland story. What really sort of was stunning about it was it has some extremely clever, very Alice in Wonderland-y or Alice through the Looking Glass style uh, puzzles. So, um, you know, the first uh, scene is you're you're trapped in your room and uh, you have a looking glass that you can step through into a sort of mirror version of your room. And a lot of the puzzles have to do with kind of um, affecting the mirror version of the room and having it affect the uh, the real version and so on. It's it's just extremely Alice in Wonderland-y. Like, it, it really has that sort of trippy, um, surreal uh, style to it. And also, it's uh, it plays differently than a lot of stuff like this that I've, I've played. I'm, uh, he apparently used something called AXMA or AXMA Story Maker. I'm not really familiar with it, but it's kind of like twiny, but with a little more like interface to it. Like it's got, uh, it's it's a point and click, you know, choose clicking on, on words in the text kind of uh, interface, but it does have, you know, movement up, down, north, east that sort of thing uh, you have an inventory um so it plays uh kind of like a in between it, it has the puzzles of like a, a parser game but it plays very smoothly in a in an almost twine style kind of way um it's a really neat game and it's uh it's up on itch.io or you can find it from the uh, if comp page obviously it's definitely worth a play um if you like uh you know puzzles or if you like lewis carroll or um you know if if the idea of a sort of a, a puzzle game version of Alice in Wonderland appeals to you, it's very neat. Yeah, I on one hand, I, I feel like immediately exhausted at the idea of something, uh, another thing derivative of Alice in Wonderland. But then at the same time, I think it's like such a, a rich world that like there's there's always room for stuff to do things well, you know. And so that that sounds like that might be that like it's it's doing it well so i'm gonna have to check that out yeah it's done extremely well um 
when I downloaded it from the uh, the IF comp page originally, originally it had a walkthrough with it, and now I'm I'm not able to find that walkthrough. I'm not sure if it's like not included online anymore. Um, but uh, I I needed it. Uh, but when I looked through it to find some of the solutions, um, they were like laugh out loud amusing. Once I kind of discovered them, so like really clever puzzles that um, some of them w- went over my head, but once I knew what was going on, I was like, it was re- very, aha, that's great. Of course it's that. So great stuff. Um, any others that anybody wants to to call out? You know, I have a moment that I loved from, it's not actually one of the games. Um, I, I think it's worth talking about at the end here, about how well run this festival is. And absolutely. A, a big part of, so the first thing that you'll notice you know trying to participate as a as a as a player and as a voter is just how well made the website is the presentation is tremendous um and then furthermore the kind of interactiveness on uh, on twitter as the uh as the results are announced and and all of that every element of the contest i thought um has been just polished to a complete t so uh, i i think it's it's wonderful. It's part of what makes me want to, you know, participate in this in this event every year. Yeah, huge thanks to Jason McIntosh who uh, who has been running the event for the last couple of years, or I don't know quite how long, um, but yeah, he's just done a tremendous job, and I, I completely agree. Just things like the presentation of the website just makes it easy and mm-hmm. fun to participate. You know, you can create an account and it'll help you keep track of which games you've played and you can vote on them as you go. And it just really makes it a smooth process. Um, feedback forms went out. Um, and the only, the only feedback that I, that I would have, the only thing I would like to see improved would be, I would love it if the games were categorized. If I am in the mood to play something that's parser based or if i'm in the mood to play something that is you know heavy or light or or you know any way that they came up with to categorize the games i would love to see that and with the number of games that we have uh i think categorization would help people to uh to pick their games uh, in a uh, but there's something also wonderful i definitely if even if they did that i would hope they would keep the random option i just love being able to randomly shuffle through i wonder if they're worried about some sort of like accidental recommend recommendation or accidental bias or something like what kind of categories just sound better than other categories you yeah. know they've been very careful about you know not wanting to bias the results that's actually something that that i mean i always get a little um nervous about our our coverage for these because i don't want to affect i mean i, I don't think our show is like a big deal in any sense, but like this is a you know this is a small mm-hmm. competition where the 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 top voted game got sixty some odd votes. Um, you know, little little bumps help. I think we um, embrace the short game bump. Uh, we are uh, <laughs> we're not picking games to try to help them in any way. We we really are just picking them based randomly or off of recommendations or whatever. But hey, that short game bump, you know. <laughs> It's real. It may and, be, but uh, <laughs> it makes me a little uncomfortable. Like, I don't want to think that I'm affecting anybody's decisions or, or you know, anything. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, statistically we're insignificant. But, sure. like, it, it's it, it's a small comp. Um, you know, so I don't know. Um, I guess the one... You wouldn't want to think that our video game recommendation show was actually <laughs> driving people to choose what video games they play. <laughs> well, it wouldn't want me... I wouldn't want it to drive well, people they, in their voting. They did write them on their own, so. That's true. Um, and uh, I guess one other thing I wanted to mention while we're, uh, while we're on the topic of things, just, just things that uh, aren't part of the top 10, but that were interesting, was... Super you know, Mario we, Odyssey. Oh, uh, yep. <laughs> uh, you know the game uh, Swigian or Swigian? Uh, Nate, Swigian. you talked about it. Swigian. On, Al Swigian? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, you talked yes. about it on, on one of our previous episodes. Yeah. Um, uh, Math Brush had hinted to me in one of his emails while we were corresponding about the, the show wh- that he actually had a, a second game in the competition under a pseudonym. And, you know, he didn't want to let us know what that game was. Um, and it turns out it was that game, Swigian. So Rain Bus oh, North funny. is also by Math Brush. Um, and it won 21st place, actually tying with a game called Harbinger that I haven't checked out. But Swigian Swig- Swig- um, is a great minimalist parser Did game. Did you just unmask Math Brush? 
No, it's on the IFDB. I don't think <laughs> okay. I'm. I don't think I'm revealing anything uh, that's not already known. I think he unmasked himself, or at least the okay. IFDB unmasked him. Because now, if you look it up on there, it's listed as um, Math Brush writing as Rainbus North. Um, oh, funny. Okay. But uh, it was it was a kind of a pleasant surprise. Like we had uh, we had kind of decided, along with Math Brush at his request, not to cover uh, his game uh, in you know it, out of concern that we might. Uh, that there might be some sort of impropriety there and that we would be uh, covering a game that, that, you know, he was helping us uh, kind of help plan our coverage and we didn't want to... No way, he got us, man. We're punks. Yeah, we were punks. <laughs> <laughs> but so congratulations to Math Brush, not only on placing in the top 10, actually in the top, what would it be, uh, top five with uh, Absence of Law, but also getting a pretty good placement with his alternate game under a, under a pseudonym. Um so both of those the Richard Bachman great. of IFCOM. <laughs> so um, I guess this is it for our coverage of IFCOM 2017. This was a great time. I really enjoy covering IFCOM every year. Um, if uh, I, I hope that I know, I know we do get some new folks who are, you know, IF enthusiasts uh, checking out the show around this time every, every year or so. Um, please stick with us. If you, uh, you know, if you enjoy uh, hearing about short video games, narrative games, we cover that sort of thing. It would be great to be able to tell people what game we're playing next. It sure would. Let's take a look at our spreadsheet that Laura so diligently put together for us earlier today. Next week, we're going to be covering sequels to a bunch of games that we covered on iOS in the past, um, because Reigns 2 is coming out with a queen-themed sequel called Her Majesty. Um, but while we're at it, we figured we'd also look at Frame 2, uh, which looks really interesting. I think people have said that it's uh, a huge improvement on the first one, which we liked pretty well. And also, um, we have Monument Valley 2, which is the same game, but you have two people playing. So iOS sequels is going to be next week's. If you have any other games that you know of the sequels on iOS that we are not mentioning right now, Please let us know. Yeah. I, ideally, uh, you know, games that have well-known first edition on iOS and are, are coming out with a uh, with a, a sequel or have come out with a sequel in the last year or so. Um, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to Reigns 2. Uh, that game was pretty cool, and I could really see some promising stuff for it. IF Comp uh, folks might in particular be interested in Reigns. If you love interactive fiction but didn't play Reigns, you should definitely check it out on iOS, and we're going to be talking about its sequel, hopefully, in the next episode. Um, yeah, and as uh, someone who is married, I don't get to swipe left and swipe right very often, uh, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to doing that again with Reigns. I think half of our Reigns episode was talking about how none of us has ever used Tinder. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're so old. So, um... Uh, Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. I've been Reagan Kelly. You can find me on Twitter at www.theshort... Well, no, you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. And you can find our show on the internet at www.theshortgame.net. You can find me on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash login. <laughs> Good save. Yep. And uh, you can find our show on the web and everywhere you'd expect to find podcasts. You can go to www.theshortgame.net. You can go to uh, Twitter and search for underscore short game that's our username on there and uh also you can find us on all of the podcast platforms speaking of which why did you know you can leave reviews on most of those podcast platforms most specifically on itunes we love itunes reviews they are uh obviously a way to uh, to let us know what you're thinking about the show but also they're a great way to support the show because really they make a big difference in terms of how many people discover the show um so even if you use another uh, platform i know i use over cast on my phone if you have a moment go ahead and subscribe to the show on itunes and maybe leave us a review there it really helps the show out rate us everywhere or you can uh let us know what you're thinking through our contact form on our website uh which is just uh, you know on the website click on contact you'll be able to type as much as you want uh laura where can people find you you can find me on twitter at laura j nash and nate where can people find you you can find me on twitter at nate stl and Shane, where can people find you? Also Twitter, at 8BitShane. And thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. <laughs>